most of the work are the people who are sitting in front of you today. And, you know, my job, actually I have three jobs here today. One is to say welcome. Two is to introduce um, Rachel McKay, assistant curator here at Woodmere Art Museum, who has her graduate degree, her master's degree in art history from the Tyler School of Art at Temple University, specializing in 20th century American art, and an art historian um, who just, you know, through the twists and turns and coincidences of life, uh, was Rachel's teacher, professor, at Temple University, uh, Susanna Gold, uh, an independent curator and scholar of 20th century American art, um, who recently has been a fellow at the Schomburg Center in New York and organized an exhibition, oh, I wanna say, I wanna say it was last year, but I think it was about a year and a half ago, yeah, yeah. On, on the artist Charles Searles, who's an important figure um, in this exhibition, and you see Charles Searles' wonderful abstraction over here, and then the, the terrific boxer in Woodmere's own collection um, by, by Searles. So um, they're gonna do a great job of walking you through a lot of the thinking behind the exhibition and, and offer plenty of time for um, question and answer. Uh, I've been asked to describe to you a couple of pieces of paper um, that I hope you'll all just pick up on your way out. Um, we have a spectacular music program on Friday nights at Woodmere as well as classical music on Saturdays. And these two pieces of paper describe that and more. We have a survey and I should say that um, we are always trying to improve how it is that we present things to our visitors and these surveys um, are more important than you can imagine, and we take them very seriously. We would love you to tell us, you know, what you've liked, what you haven't liked, what you think we could do better, and um, it would help us a great deal, and you can just, you know, pick one up and, and bring it back to us or fill it out quickly sitting on the porch watching the kids running around the hay maze and then give it to Amanda um, at the front desk. And then finally, um, we have a series um, of visits to artist studios, artists who are involved in this exhibition, and this piece of paper, it says Art Dive, so dive into the art, um, visits um, to the studio of, of James Brantley, Kathleen Spicer, and Barbara Bullock, and the first one, the visit to James Brantley's studio, is this Thursday, October 15th, and you know, we would love to have a good crowd there, and he would love you know, he would love to, be, to meet people who are enthusiastic about art. So, so please take a look at that. And that's the end of the commercials. <laughs> and um, I thank you for being here. And I'm going to hand this over to Susanna and Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for the introduction. Uh, as you know, this exhibition that Susanna and I curated is called We Speak, Black Artists in Philadelphia, 1920s to the 1970s. And um, as with all exhibitions at Woodmere, it was, it was an inherently collaborative exhibition that had contributions from all levels of staff. So in addition to our role as curators of the exhibition, Hildy Tao has an amazing series of programs and films that she has um, organized and arranged. Rick Ortwine, our director of exhibitions, installed the gallery in this beautiful manner. And of course, Sally Larson is responsible for getting all of the work here. So it wouldn't even be here without her. <laughs> so there are many, um, many members of the staff who, who contributed in incredibly meaningful ways to the success of the exhibition. Um, for a brief introduction, just a, a brief overview of the exhibition, um, it does cover five decades of artistic expression in Philadelphia. There are 50 artists represented in the exhibition. There are over 70 works in the show. Um, the date range, the 20s, we began with the New Negro Arts Movement, and then we ended in the 70s with the Bicentennial Era. 
a time when the values of freedom and individualism were being reconsidered in America. Um, we decided that the focus of the exhibition would be, the curatorial framework would be arranged around a focus on exhibitions, uh, institutions, and organizations. So both traditional academic institutions that teach artists the basics of becoming an artist, but then also community-based organizations that provide exhibition opportunities, networking opportunities, um, chances to build portfolios, to interact with various generations of artists working in Philadelphia. So it was really an analysis of how institutions, community-based organizations, and artist groups supported the careers of black artists and how they, how black artists sought them out, formed them themselves, or took advantage of the opportunities that were present. The method of building the exhibition was also inherently collaborative. Um, Susanna and I, from the outset, sought to involve artists who are living now, as well as family members of deceased artists, um, professionals working in the field, including scholars and curators, as well as gallery directors, museum professionals, and, and other art professionals and administrative people who represented various institutions and to, to get their feedback about the direction of the exhibition through a series of interviews, which was, in addition to the work that went into building the exhibition, a large part of the show was this oral interview project that Susanna and I did um, interviewing 24 people and um, learning about their experiences and asking them, learning from them about which artists were important during this time period and which institutions were really functioning in a way that supported the careers of black artists. So it, the title We Speak refers to not only Woodmere speaking about its collection and its holdings and the significance of this time period, but also that we speak in terms of the artists who are still living speak and those who are deceased are speaking through their family members and various representatives. So a collaborative, um, a collaborative effort that, that deserves, um, many people deserve recognition for the success of this show. So what we'd like to do today, I'll explain our goals for this talk to you, is uh, to really demystify the curatorial process. So we're going to explain from the very beginnings what our motivation was to have this show in the first place. Uh, we'll walk you uh, through all stages of the, uh, the evolution of the exhibition, from selecting works uh, to thinking about what ideas you know, are most relevant, to putting the catalog together, to thinking about how to uh, present the work to you. Uh, we'll also talk about the evolution of our ideas, how our, our ideas kind of took uh, unexpected turns, developed along the way. Um, all the way through to catalog production, putting the, you know, putting the actual uh, uh, object uh, together and how we decided what intellectual material would go into that. And then, of course, you know, the installation itself. And we can explain the logic of, of how we wished to communicate our ideas uh, through arrangement. Um, and then finally, at the, at the end of our uh, discussion, we would like to hear from you. So please, you know, as we're having, uh, or as we're presenting, please, by all means, you know, think of questions that you'd like to hear uh, us comment on, and we'll, have, we'll save those till the end, and we'll pass the microphone around so we can hear your thoughts. Okay, so if we start at the very beginning, um, you know, let's think about the motivations for this show, and we'll, we'll explain what we wanted to do. We first started with Woodmere Art Museum's uh, holdings of works by artists of African descent in the collection. And they're a healthy number. There's uh, two on, that you see on the screen right now. Uh, Sam Brown's Erlene, age nine, from 1956. This is a painting of Brown's daughter who happened to die at a very young age as a child. So it's a very emotional uh, portrait of her. Uh, also Claude Clark's Brothers and Sister from 1949, um, if we can see the next one. Don Camp's Winter Grass from 79 to 81. Uh, this was produced as a series of photographs. We have a series of um, seven photographs up in the balcony. 
Um, this series of work was produced when Camp was transitioning uh, from being a journalist, photographer, journalistic photographer, to being a fine artist. Uh, and these series of images was taken near his hometown where he grew up, so also very intimate works. A number of these images, or holdings rather, uh, in Woodmere's collection had been shown in a number of contexts. So for example, Don Camp's Winter Grass uh, was, or I guess it currently still is, in the Inside Out exhibition. I don't know if you've seen that around town. You might have seen it and not noticed or realized what it was. Uh, but the Inside Out exhibition was an initiative by the Philadelphia Art Museum, and it involves a number of local museums who gave the rights to have some of their works reproduced and placed outside in the city. So you might have seen them. I've seen some on bike trails that I've been in or outside of local art centers um, or there's some at SEPTA stations. Mm -hmm. Um, Don Camp's uh, reproduction is on Germantown Avenue, so you might have seen it actually on the way here, um, and it's still there. So the goals of Inside Out was to uh, bring the art to the people, right, so that uh, they can see the images and perhaps be inspired to go inside and take a look at the other images. Um, so Don Camp's work has been showed by Winmere in that context. Uh, Charles Jay's Floral Still Life, 1977, was shown in the exhibition Keeping It Real, Recent Acquisitions of Narrative and Realist Art, as was uh, work by Dox Thrash and Charles Searles. Um, is there another? That perhaps, okay. Um, and so Woodmere had shown a number of these works in a number of different contexts, but they had not yet you know, shown these works in a context where connections were drawn uh, among this body of work. So in part, the motivation for this show was to, to find out what connections there were. Um, so we began with that collection and then expanded out uh, from there. And then considering uh, Woodmere's collection, we um, thought about our guiding narrative that I had talked about earlier, the focus on institutions. And when we selected work, we selected artists who had, who had a role in some kind of institution or community group in Philadelphia. So within Woodmere's own collection, we have Alan R. Freelon, who was the first director the first black director of art in the public school district of Philadelphia. And his painting, Nine Coming Up, is on view against the wall over here showing people coming out of a coal mine. And there's other works in Woodmere's collection, Louis Sloan's Portal on Spring Garden Street, who was a graduate of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and taught there for many decades, influencing generations of artists coming through Philadelphia and establishing their careers here, as well as Dax Thrash, uh, draw for 24th and Ridge, which is upstairs on the Dorothy Del Bueno Balcony Gallery. Dax Thrash is representative of many things in Philadelphia, of course, one of which is his participation in the WPA, which was an organization that served to employ artists, but also to teach them printmaking techniques and to expose them to other artists of various um, skills and reputations and generations. So um, with all of these, with the depth of Woodmere's collection and focusing on the institutions, as a curator you have to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller in your focus or else your show will end up having 300 objects in it and we can't handle that. So to, to to distill the focus down even more, we, um, we had to think about the date range. Woodmere's selections span a great range of time from the late 30s all the way up until present day with Barbara Bullock's incredibly beautiful Trayvon Most Precious Blood juxtaposed with A Dreamer by Claude Clark. So the with the institutional focus, it didn't naturally lead us to a chronological framework. Each institution exists separately and has its own chronological history. So the history of PAFA does not coincide with the history of the Barnes Foundation or the Pyramid Club. So therefore, we had to pick um, dates that were significant in terms of art history, of course, but then also that were significant to African Americans living in Philadelphia and just, you know, the history of events going on in, in the United States and particularly in Philadelphia. So 
in terms of choosing the 1920s, it was a time after the, um, the global um, and political conflict of World War I, and particularly um, the, we focused on the writings of Alain Locke, who um, is a, a major figure in the New Negro Arts Movement, also called the Harlem Renaissance. It was not confined to the area of Harlem. There were, of course, artists working within the cultural um, field of the Harlem Renaissance, a new Negro arts movement in Philadelphia, and particularly Alain Locke, whose publication of the legacy of the ancestral arts in 1925 espoused black artists to look to Africa and to, um, to take possession of that historical precedent in terms of an aesthetic development. And then to understand that and to articulate that in a way that is American, number one, and unique to the 20th century during the time in which these, these artists were living. So we began, yes. I, I have to make a quick announcement, um, and I'm sorry to interrupt, I really am, but there is a Mini Cooper outside that is locked, but it was left running. And um, we're just concerned about the car. <laughs> And so if, if um, Ron Tarver, <laughs> Ron is my good friend. <laughs> Mystery solved. <laughs> okay, crisis averted. Thank you, Bill. Um, you, can, you can go ahead. Okay, all right, so, um, We've, start, we've started in the 1920s and we work our way all the way up to the 1970s where we book our, uh, bookend our uh, exhibition. Um, the 1970s is the bicentennial era. It's a post-civil rights era and it's the height of black power. Uh, this is also a time when many area institutions are becoming broadened uh, under new, fresh, bold leadership and opportunities are actually starting to open up more readily for uh, artists of African descent. Um, we choose the 1970s for a number of uh, um, cultural reasons that I just listed, but also uh, in terms of the institutions itself, themselves, this is the time when the African American uh, Cultural and Historical Museum, known today as the African American Museum in Philadelphia, is founded. Um, and that might seem a strange point to end our analysis at this very exciting time when we have new insti uh, institutions coming onto the horizon. Um, in, in many ways, it's, it's a strange, perhaps, moment. In other ways, it's a logical moment because it, it brings our story not to a close, uh, but it brings it up to the next stage. So although we're ending our story at a time when doors are opening, um, wider for many artists. Um, we open it at a time where we can introduce new institutions and, and explain what they are uh, starting to do. And then we recognize that the next chapter in the story really deserves its own exhibition. So we do not intend uh, to communicate that the 1970s was an ending point, uh, but rather Wood Mirror Art Museum anticipates telling the next chapter in its story in its future exhibition plan. So it's a to be continued story. Um, now the limits that we chose and explained from the 1920s to the 1970s necessarily does limit our selections. So we couldn't include all of the work that Woodmere has in its collection. For example, you, you saw the uh, Barbara Bullock, uh, Trayvon, Most Precious Blood. That's a very recent work. We, we wouldn't be able to include that in this particular exhibition. And it also means that uh, a number of artists who were working in Philadelphia couldn't necessarily be included, even if they fell within this time frame because we really wanted to choose those artists very consciously uh, whose work and career uh, corresponded to our goals of thinking about how the institutions of Philadelphia affected artists' careers. Uh, so that relationship between an artist's career's development and the role of the institution uh, was very significant. So we wanted to make sure that we made careful choices that told that specific story. Um, so we could not include everything and everyone, but rather instead made um, 
judicious choices about what would be um, in, in the exhibition itself. Um, so once, I guess once we developed that focus, um, we thought about which images to include. So then we began to really build the checklist because our options now weren't limitless. So we could actually think about what institutions held what works, which works. So um, as, an, as an institution that, whose mission is to celebrate the art and artists of Philadelphia, we always look to our sister institutions first and look in, into their holdings and see how we can borrow work from them and highlight their collection as well as ours because as a group, we all serve to support the artists of Philadelphia. So we did research either independently into the collections of various institutions or made appointments with curators or collections managers and saw work. So within this exhibition, we've borrowed from the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, whose um, self-portrait by Doc Strash is on view here, as well as the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, Prince Twins, or Twins Seven Sevens painting, Spirit of My Reincarnation, Brothers and Sisters. My mother, Bearing Agony, who's from Nigeria, born in Nigeria, but um, participated in the Ile Ife Cultural Center and was an inspirational figure for artists working in the 1970s, as well as um, work from the collection of LaSalle University Art Museum. John T. Harris's checker player at Marion Anderson Playground. John T. Harris taught at Cheney University, influencing generations of artists in the decades that he taught there. And Laura Wheeler Waring's Fanny Jackson Cop Coppin portrait from Cheney University, which of course is an incredibly influential institution for um, anyone seeking an education, of course, but um, of course, Cheney University and its art program educated many black artists, and Fanny Jackson Coppin was the, one of, was the first female um, president of Cheney University. We also have work from the African American Museum in Philadelphia, and Charles Pridgen is not uh, affiliated with a particular institution, but was a figure whose studio served as a center for artists to meet and discuss work and receive critiques and to learn about exhibition opportunities and to learn about what artists were currently working on in their own practice. So in addition to uh, perhaps what you could call more traditional uh, modes, pathways of support and career building, there was of course these figures who functioned as mentors and whose, whose studios and classrooms served as a place where artists could meet. Um, also, we, we also visited um, archives in addition to just museums that have holdings. So the Free Library of Philadelphia has an amazing print collection. And this is Raymond Steth's Evolution of Swing upstairs on the balcony gallery. And of course, Romberg Center for Research in Black Culture, whose holdings are immense and who obviously has work by Philadelphia artists such as Horace Pippin and Selma Burke. And Horace Pippin celebrates Marian Anderson in his 1940 portrait of her and Selma Burke's um, touching sculpture of this almost over life-size head of this unid unidentified, his name is Jim, but it's unknown who, it's, who exactly Jim is. So, um, in addition to museums, archives played an important role in our, in our search for work, as well as um, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, who has a WPA art program, who has a serious collection of WPA art program prints, including Raymond Steth's Southern Barbecue. And we also visited private collectors whose um, encouragement was incredibly important for us and who also pointed us in directions uh, where we could seek out new artists and other institutions who, and community groups that were functioning at the time and helped us to see 
areas that you know we may have been lacking in. So we have Sherry Howard's Untitled Three Women Rejoicing by Columbus Knox, and Lewis Tanner Moore's um, Howard Watson's Marian Anderson. So visiting these private collectors was very influential in terms of guiding us to new artists that we hadn't known and new people that we should think about interviewing who would have important things to say. And finally, Kevin Pugh, who, um, whose wonderful work by Ed Jones is on view in the back of this gallery that really celebrates the energy of a city. You see this streetcar coming at you and the cable lines and the lines of the tracks and the lights flashing and there's a, a light in the distance as if another car is barreling up behind it. So the work really celebrates the energy and the vitality of a city. So in addition to um, museums, archives, and private collectors, we also went on more traditional studio visits, which is generally a practice that curators do. You go see work by artists in their studio. Often our studio visits coincided with our, um, our recording of interviews with, with particular people. So Richard Watson's The Hungry Eye and Martina Johnson Allen's together. Suzanne and I went to their homes and recorded interviews with them where they spoke about their personal experiences working in Philadelphia and building their careers here. And then they graciously showed us their wonderful work and we were able to select work that was within our time frame and was significant to the focus of our exhibition. Uh, there was also many people who participated in the interview process who um, pointed us to uh, artists that we weren't aware of. So um, Alan Edmonds cited Louise Clement Hoff as an incredibly important teacher of his who taught at the Fleischer Art Memorial. So then we sought out Louise Clement Hoff and went to her studio and found this amazing work as well. And he also um, pointed us to Roland Ayers um, who we went and visited his, um, his wife who graciously donated work to the collection. So in addition to lending work to the exhibition, a lot of the people that we visited with um, recognized the, the goal of Woodmere and felt that work was, it was important for us to represent their work in our collection as well. So um, one of the goals of mine always as a curator at Woodmere is to build our collection through the exhibitions. And I think that we do a very good job of that. We see where we are lacking, where we could build our collection, and we actively seek out work to fill that void. And it, I'm always, it's always a source of pride for me that our collection grows as our exhibitions develop. So thank you. Sheila, you're right there. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we also, um, other, other people introduced us to additional artists, um, including Kimberly Camp, who has an interview published in our catalog, who said we need to find out who Laura William Chesso is and go find her work. And now we have a wonderful work upstairs on view. And um, A.M. Weaver, who's an independent curator, also participated in a conversation in the catalog, said, you know, you need to, you need to look at Ed Hughes. So as I was saying in the beginning, this process was very collaborative and there was no, there, we were completely, um, not dependent upon, but, but we looked to these people who were knowledgeable about this time period and the people working in this period to tell us how we should grow the exhibition. So it was a very rewarding experience to meet these people and to, to have the flexibility to say, okay, we're going to add this, we're going to add this. As a small institution, and a small staff, we really do have a great amount of flexibility to add work at, you know, at a somewhat late date. <laughs> and to just always be, be filtering our ideas and, and honing in our focus and, you know, expanding, exp expanding the scope of our show, which is incredibly important. 
Um, Reba Dickerson Hill was introduced to us by Nasher May Lindo, who was the former president of the National Conference of Artists, a organization that provided um, networking opportunities as well as exhibition opportunities for artists in Philadelphia. So a, a great many people contributed to the actual work that's, that's on view right now. And then the names that Rachel has introduced, they're really only a few of the names of the people that we spoke to. So when we invited um, people um, to come talk to us and when we recorded these interviews, we tried to invite uh, a range of voices. Um, so in addition you know, to, to those that Rachel has mentioned, we of course wanted to talk to the artists themselves. So we, we interviewed a number of living artists. So for example, Mo Brooker, Richard Watson, I saw you come in a few minutes ago, um, Barbara Bullock, James Brantley. We interviewed, you know, we, we consciously tried to start with the artists themselves. Uh, so we had a number of living artists that we wanted to hear directly from. Um, many of our artists are no longer living. Uh, in those cases, we try to contact family members. Uh, we talked to a number of Alan Freelon's descendants. Uh, he, we talked to his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, um, some in-laws. Um, so we, and we recorded those interviews as well. Also, Laura Keane, uh, who was married to Paul Keane. Um, so in addition to artists, descendants of artists, we wanted to talk to professionals in the field uh, as well. Uh, Kimberly Camp is direct, was former director of the Barnes Foundation, so that perspective was important to have uh, for us. Uh, Phil Sumter was former art director of the Pyramid Club, the social club that was uh, started in 1937 in Philadelphia, went through the 19, or up until the, the 1960s. Um, and this was a social club first and foremost, but it offered uh, an important uh, venue for African American artists to show their work, to socialize together, to meet artists not only in Philadelphia, but who were nationally known. Uh, and really get a network system developed uh, in that place. So Phil Sumter, who was there, who was participating in the direction of the art program at Pyramid Club, he was a very important voice for us to consult as well. Uh, Sandy Webster, as a gallery owner, was able to give us the perspective of the marketplace. Uh, so we really tried to go in many different directions so that we could have different kinds of perspectives come together in this catalog. Uh, we ended up having conducting 14 interviews, or conversations, we'll call them, um, between Rachel, myself, and other members of Woodmere's staff and those that we interviewed. Um, and I think we interviewed 24 different participants. That includes not, not only the list you know, of artists and museum professionals you see behind us, but we also had, at the very end, uh, a roundtable discussion. And what we did at the roundtable discussion, we had Helen Shannon, Ron Tarver, A.M. Weaver, and Jean Woodley come into Woodmere and meet with a, a number of staff members here. And this was an opportunity not to conduct yet another interview, but to really all sit down around the conference table and talk about the findings that we had, um, you know, that we had gathered in our interviews. So each of the participants understood, you know, the topics involved, and we brought up the kinds of questions we asked. We brought up our, you know, the patterns that we noted, and really we discussed them in that small group to be able to figure out, well, what does all of this mean, uh, and to bring it together and reflect on it in a in a, uh, in a detached. Uh, manner. And that was very useful to us to kind of think about, well, we've done this research, we've gathered this information, you know, what did we learn from it? So that brings us to, you know, the question of, well, what did we talk about? What did these interviews consist of? And what patterns did we find? Um, one of the things that was consistent among our discussions was the issue of the marketplace. Um, everyone was rather um, on the same page about the limited opportunities for artists of African descent in Philadelphia in terms of their commercial experiences. Um, it was very tough. It was very tough. There were not many uh, galleries. There were not many commercial outlets readily available. It was very difficult to find those places. Uh, so Sandy Webster, as someone who does represent a number of African-American artists, was, was a, you know, 
a, a gallery that came up over and over and over as being particularly significant. Um, but the lack of representation was something that was often noted throughout our interviews, and that was something we found to be uh, consistent from the 1920s all the way to the 1970s, one might say even beyond that point up until today. Uh, the experience of education was also something that we consistently asked our uh, participants. Um, and we got a, a number of responses. We did have some stories about you know, negative treatment in schools by professors or by the administration. Um, but that you know, really was balanced by stories of um, really great opportunities, wonderful relationships that were developed, um, not only in a formal school institutional setting between you know, professor and student, but among students themselves. Um, networks of colleagues that were developed and even continue to this day. Uh, friends that became friends in their you know, early 20s that are friends decades later. So that was very heartening to hear about uh, an institution is not just a place to earn a degree, to learn your profession, and to get started on your career, but it really seemed to be a home for many people, and that was, um, uh, that was a, an interesting aspect of the institution that we you know, hadn't really thought about in the, before. The issue of aesthetics uh, also came up in terms of what artists are painting, or I should say rather, what artists were expected to paint, artists of African descent. So the issue of what the public or what professors or what colleagues felt um, black artists should be painting in terms of subject matter, how they should be painting, um, you know, and what role heritage you know, should, and I say should in uh, quotation marks, um, what role heritage should play in their work. And this was a point uh, on which many of the participants diverged. Um, some artists felt that heritage was virtually irrelevant to their practice. It, it didn't come up, it didn't have anything to do with what happens in the studio. Uh, other artists felt very connected to their heritage and wanted consciously to communicate that in their work and through their work. Um, so we had a, a great range of perspective on what, what it means uh, to be a black artist in terms of how you produce, what your practice is like, and what you do with your material. Um, particularly artists associated with the Ile Ife Black Humanitarian Center, um, heritage was very important uh, to those artists. So Barbara Bullock, for example, uh, this is her Dark God, so she's also right here to my right. Um, Barbara Bullock was the um, head of the art department at the Ile Ife Black Humanitarian Center. This was uh, an organization, a community-based organization, that offered classes not only in visual art, but in theater, in music, uh, in dance. It was founded by the choreographer, Arthur Hall, with the intent specifically to uh, preserve uh, African aesthetics through art, through music, through dance. Uh, so the courses were you know, offered with heritage in mind. So Barbara Bullock was uh, very active in Ile Ife, as was Charles Searles. Uh, this is Charles Searles' Three Souls in One on the screen and also over to the right, um, 1977. Both Barbara Bullock and Charles Searles met and got to know the artist Twin Seven Seven at uh, Ile Ife, and you can see Twin 77 right next to Charles Searles on the screen. And they're there together because Twin 77 was from Nigeria, and he you know, was, was born and began his craft in Africa and brought those ideas you know, to the United States, to Philadelphia, when he started living and working here. Uh, and when you see the Searles painting next to the Twin 77 uh, pen and ink drawing, it, they're very different. They're different in scale, they're different in subject matter, uh, they're different um, you know, in, in what they communicate, but there are also a lot of similarities. So aesthetically, they both share you know, kind of stark outlines uh, to imagery forms that are filled with colorful, very you know, patterned, um, you know, highly patterned uh, material within that. And so the, that aesthetic similarity that you see does have its basis in Yoruba art tradition. So it's interesting to see how that is carried over. It's certainly not imitating uh, African traditions, but it, it, it's relevant and it's related, and that's something that the Ile Ife Black Humanitarian, 
Black Humanitarian Center promoted. Uh, let's see. Yes, okay, so that's you. So um, as we learned about more artists working in these distinct community centers and organizations, we needed to broaden the scope of our exhibition like we've both been mentioning. So we knew about the canonical institutions of Philadelphia, Mo Brooker, who was educated at Tyler, an important educational institution, Tem it's Temple University's art school, as well as Raymond Saunders, um, a graduate of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. So PAFA and Tyler were obviously on our mind. You would naturally start there and with the rest of the schools, more College of Art and Design, Penn, and um, University of the Arts, excuse me. So you would begin with those kinds of institutions as a place where artists would begin their careers, but we weren't really aware of important places like settlement houses, including the Wharton Center, these community-based institutions that provided educational and recreational opportunities for adult and young um, young artists living in Center City and the surrounding area, as well as the National Conference of Artists, which I have mentioned, a networking organization that exhibited in um, community centers and held, meeting in, held meetings in private homes and shared ideas with artists about professional and artistic development. Uh, we did know about community groups, community centers, including Fleischer Art Memorial and the Ile Ife Center that Susanna had been talking in depth about previously that exposed artists to um, art making in a variety of forms, including dance and drama and music. Um, this is a slide of Louise Clement Hoff, whose work is on view behind me, teaching a student who towers over her. <laughs> she is a very short person <laughs> at Fleischer, where she was just recognized as, um, as an influential teacher and member of the art community in Philadelphia, taught there and at Woodmere for many years. Um, these images lead me to talk about um, one of the other things that was on our mind while we were building the exhibition, which is how to illustrate these interviews. They're so integral and so important in terms of scholarship in Philadelphia that we obviously can't have just a blank, you know, a page filled with words. It's, we're an art museum. We need to have images everywhere. So um, certain archival archives and libraries played a large role in providing us with images for the catalog that really fleshed out some of the um, documentary evidence of the happenings and the, the cultural movements that we were discussing. So both of these are from Temple University's Special Collections, which was an important source for us, as well as, of course, the Brandywine Workshop and Archives, which is almost, it is an archive, almost a museum in itself of amazing work and photographs and everything, as well as the Philadelphia Museum of Art archives, which provided images of artists working, as you can see Sam Brown working at the press, and Sam Gilliam standing in front of his installation of his work at the Art Museum in 1975. So these um, archives, librarians, archivists, really were integral to our, our development. Of course, the special collections has work by important photographers, including Mosley and Jack T. Franklin. And we can see two examples of a small child receiving painting and receiving art instruction at Fleischer Art Memorial. And then, just particularly, the Mosley collection at part of the Charles L. Bloxon Afro-American collection at Temple University is an amazing resource for anyone doing research um, on any period of black history. And he had, uh, Mosley um, took a lot of photographs of the Pyramid Club, two of which are on view here, the entryway to the Pyramid Club and then the bar, which served as a social, really a center for social life for 
black Philadelphians in the 40s and 50s, but also had important art exhibitions that invited artists from across the United States. So um, with Bloxin, the special collections and archives, we were really able to capture this time period that we were talking about in a way that juxtaposes the very personal interpretations that are articulated in the artwork and then the more um, objective archival evidence of what was going on in Philadelphia at this time. And Susanna, as I was saying, you know, as curators, you shift focuses, you change ideas, you see things that attract your eye. And we were so drawn to the Mosley images that we decided that he was a person who's, who also needed to be represented in the exhibition, not just be reproduced in the catalog as an important photographer of Philadelphia life, but that he needed to be represented as really an artist working in Philadelphia, recording recording these moments of, of, um, of Philadelphia history. So we see Pearl Bailey, the beautiful, very posed portrait of her, and children at Chicken Bone Beach. And I have found out at the VIP opening that Leslie, the archivist at Bloxon, knows the name of every single child in that photograph. <laughs> and one of them even called her after he saw himself through the digital collection and said, I am that small child in that photograph. So um, the Bloxon and Temple is an amazing resource. Um, so the, the introduction of Mosley into the exhibition itself, and I'll just point out really quickly oh, that, you know, there. Mosley's four, we have a suite of four images by Mosley up on the, uh, the balcony gallery, so I hope that after the talk you'll explore the exhibition yourselves and look at them up close. Um, but that brings us to the, the installation itself, you know, how do you have all of these, you have over 70 works of art, how, what do you do with them? How do you communicate your ideas through arrangement? Um, and the arrangement, the installation, was decided by a committee of several of Woodmere's staff and uh, several participants uh, in the roundtable discussion that we conducted. And we all met together and kind of, you know, hashed out our ideas about what we thought should go where and ordered best to communicate uh, to viewers. So it, what we decided to do is in the Schneider Gallery, which is the first gallery that you enter that houses this exhibition right up at the top of the steps, we decided that the Schneider Gallery would serve as a space that, that outlined our ideas for the exhibition. So when you first walk into that, uh, that room, you, you see a number of images and they each introduce um, you know, the ideas that we were thinking about with institutions and with networks um, that, you, that we fully explore with the, the catalog and with the remainder of the exhibition. Um, so what, we, what you see when you walk in there, uh, Meta Warwick Fuller's maquette for Ethiopia Awakening is in our earliest image, it's circa 1914. That's an image that introduces the new Negro arts movement. And what this, this figure, it's, it's quite small. It's a study for a larger, almost full uh, length size sculpture. Uh, but the sculpture, it, it, it appears to be, it looks like, through its title and through its you know, visual properties, it looks like an African figure. You see the Egyptian headdress and her uh, legs that are bound in something that looks like um, papyrus or, or mummification. But you see a figure that is awakening, right? And it's not meant to actually be an African figure, but to, Af to represent African Americans at that time, awakening or coming into their own. Uh, right on the cusp of the new Negro arts movement and kind of coming alive and being able to, um, you know, have this renaissance uh, of culture. So, um, so that's a work that introduces that idea of what, you know, where we're starting the exhibition. We also have Doc's Thrash's uh, played out or intermission that introduces the Works Progress Administration's fine print workshop. And Rachel mentioned this earlier, this was a, a, a government funded program that had its own fine printmaking workshop. And the goal was to, to provide jobs for artists, uh, and a number of them happened to be African American at the fine print workshop in Philadelphia. Uh, and, and the WPA gave these artists the freedom to develop their art, to, you know, to come up with new ideas in fine art. Um, and Doc's Thrash, you know, as a member of that, was able to develop the carborundum process, uh, which is a, a printmaking process that results in these very rich, deep 
dark tones that you can see uh, in this image. Uh, other ideas that are introduced, when you first walk into the gallery, you can't help but be drawn to this pairing uh, at the wall opposite. It, it's James Brantley's Clarence Morgan on the left, and on the right, Barclay Hendricks' painting of Brantley called JSB III, James Sherman Brantley III. Um, and this arrangement of three artists, James Brantley, Barclay Hendricks, and Clarence Morgan, who you see seated, this, these three were uh, all students at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts at the same time. And they were this, these, these paintings were painted you know, at the end of their program when they were starting to become uh, you know, emerging artists onto the uh, professional landscape. But they introduced the idea of the, the educational institution, the formal institution. But not only that, they demonstrate that relationships that, that develop uh, within this. So to see these three who are painting each other and inside each other's studios all at the same time and got to know each other uh, and work together at this institution is part of what this pairing describes. Uh, Charles Pridgen, this is Blues. I think this was up on the screen a few minutes ago, but we have that in the Schneider Gallery um, because, you know, Pridgen was an important mentor outside of the traditional arts school. Um, so a number of students from different schools, a number of students who weren't enrolled in an art school, uh, but were still artists nonetheless, would meet at Pridgen's home. They would, you know, come and they'd talk about art, they'd talk about art history, they'd talk about philosophy, um, and he would provide an important mentoring um, service uh, to these artists, and his name was mentioned many times. So that, that form of networking that is outside of a traditional institution is important. Uh, and we found that repeatedly, and that needed to come into our, our, our discussion as a main theme. Um, this is Ellen Altiberino. It's a picture of her mother or grandmother? Mother. Mother, Queen, whose name is Queenie. Um, and we chose to put this uh, image in the Schneider because it, it introduced the exhibiting institution, the museum. Uh, Ellen Powell Tiberino was the first artist to have a one-person show at the Afro-American Cultural, Historical and Cultural Museum, the AAM, now the AAMP, in 1977. So that, you know, that's a very important platform for her to kind of come out uh, onto the professional landscape. So we wanted to have the exhibiting institution as a, um, as an important element uh, in the Schneider Gallery. Uh, but we also wanted to recognize self-taught artists that maybe weren't associated with traditional institutions because they still have a place in the story outside of that uh, kind of formal arrangement. So Horace Pippin, uh, John Brown going to his hanging, 1942 is on the screen as representing self-taught artists. Now, um, Pippin was championed by Albert Barnes at the Barnes Foundation and did you know, develop a relationship with Barnes uh, and did learn about art and, you know, from the works in the Barnes Foundation directly. But nonetheless, as, an, as a self-taught artist, he was still in many ways uh, outside of the mainstream. So we wanted to make sure that, that we included some of those other artists that were outside of the mainstream, but still an important part of the uh, Philadelphia story. Um, once you think about that quote-unquote outline that we provide in the Schneider, each of those ideas are fully explored in the Cook Gallery where you're sitting now and the Dorothy Del Bueno Balcony Gallery above you. So each section is, you know, has its own space with text panels that, you know, explain um, what it is that the, the group, each grouping is communicating. There are also other ideas uh, circulating in these galleries. So for example, the Pyramid Club, uh, the Barnes Foundation each have their own um, area. They're in the back of the gallery. Um, what's on the screen now is Humbert Howard's The Yellow Cup from 1949 to 50 as an illustration of the Pyramid Club. I had mentioned Phil Sumter as an art director of the Pyramid Club. Well, Howard hum I'm sorry, Humbert Howard uh, was the first art director at the Pyramid Club. So this painting represents you know, his practice as well as his role at the Pyramid Club. This also happened to be purchased by the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts when it was shown in an exhibition there, and that's uh, where it remains. So we're grateful that they loaned it to this exhibition. So I encourage you, I know that, oh gosh, we've run out of time. We still want to entertain questions, but I, I encourage after 
um, we're finished here, that you will be able to explore the galleries, all three of them, and be able to think about you know, what um, the arrangements that we've created and how they communicate to you.